Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar. This is the second part of our series on colonial conservation, and it's supported by our allies at Survival International. I'll be your host for today. My name is Alejandra Piazzola, and I'm one of the joint coordinators uh, for XR Internationalist Solidarity Network, where we're working to bring these conversations together and build networks of resistance connecting grassroots communities across the global north and the global south. So one of the key conversations within these networks, it's one of the dynamics that we will be discussing today in the seminar, in this like, webinar, <laughs> around colonial conservations and the very different ways in which the sector of conservation is seen across the world. You know, here in the UK, it's like you get cuddly toys that are get given to British school children when they sponsor a cute tiger or a panda. But in other parts of the world, what they see is the supply of weapons to paramilitary groups who are forcibly evicting indigenous communities from their ancestral homelands. So we as XRISN see this as a key topic because many of the indigenous groups that we're working with cite this like conservation industry as one of the biggest threats to their livelihood, to their community and to their existence as an indigenous like community. And yet here in the global north, this, as we are in the UK, many of these conservation groups are often seen as like key solutions to the climate and ecological crisis. So to bridge this like difficult divide, like we're really thrilled to be working with our incredible friends from Survival International. First, we have Stephen Corey. Um, he's esteemed and much respected uh, director of Survival International. We've got Mordecai Ogada who's a powerful grassroots activist and speaker from Kenya. And Fiore Longo, she's one of Survival International's uh, main campaigners. For those of you who didn't catch part one of our series, we'd encourage you to check this out. It's titled The Eco-Fascist History of Conservation. Um, in this little webinar, we covered the basic history of this modern conservation as it emerged during the colonial period. And we discussed a number of the key dynamics, especially how this um, conservation is often referred to as anti-human conservation. And the, its dominant idea is based on humans being bad for nature. And thus, in order to conserve nature, we must remove humans from it because they're bad. And well, this runs counter to all what we know about the amazing ways in which indigenous communities have lived in harmony, you know, with the rest of the world for centuries. And in fact, 5% of the world's population safeguard 80% of the world's biodiversity. So it really challenges this idea that humans are bad for it. In fact, it's completely the opposite. It's more about our culture and stuff, which is all discussed in the previous seminar and i'm sure our speakers here today will do a much better job than myself at talking about this but yeah we're really excited to keep building on this conversation and welcome both claire farrell and gail bradbrook who are both leading figures in extinction rebellion uk who are here to join us in this conversation and how around how these issues intersect with the work that Extinction Rebellion is trying to do to avert the climate and ecological crisis. First of all, I wanted to invite Stephen to frame this conversation first up and then give space for the discussion to evolve as we do discuss the different ways in which this information and this history impacts upon climate and ecological action in the global north by groups like XR and what can these groups do to challenge the dominant forms of colonial conservation going forward. So without further ado, Stephen, um, would you like to get us started? I would only like to add, before handing over to Mordecai, that this is a going to be a massive battle which is going to involve um, conservation, protected areas, climate change, biodiversity, 
and uh, you you name it, there's going to be a there is already a, a massive battle going on about this, um, which the, the the public is largely uh, unaware of, almost entirely unaware of. And in that struggle, on the one hand, on the one side, we have the big conservation organisations who are working very closely with governments, who are working very closely with corporations, very closely with the UN, uh, very closely with the big foundations, and they're all basically saying the same thing. And that is, we have to have 30% of the globe as protected areas, and this is going to be great for biodiversity. It's going to stop climate change. It's going to stop pandemics or reduce their likelihood and uh, in fact, uh, our position is that it will do uh, none of none of that, absolutely none of that. And in fact, it will have, in many ways, the reverse impact, because uh, it will be a land grab. And the land grabs already going on in the name of conservation are upsetting uh, millions of people. And the, these people aren't basically, in many places, simply not going to put up with it. So they're in places like Kenya, they're cutting fences, the pastoralists are cutting fences to conservancies going back in. Uh, the conservancies are guarded by private militias, as Alejandra said. The thing is armed, um, and uh, it, it, there's, there's, there's going to be major trouble if this, if this is rolled out. And that's what they want to do, is they want to roll it out. What, from our point of view, what we're looking at is a land grab. It's control of the land. It's very little to do with conservation, actually. Um, it's to do basically with money. And if, if you control these areas, you can turn them into money. They're actually openly sold as investments, not only in places like Kenya, which use the, you know, the new conservancies, use the term investment. If you look at what Conservation International is saying, it's all about investment. We can make a lot of money out of nature. That's the idea. And they are and will make a lot of money out of nature and uh, I think this is we should all be extremely concerned about this and be aware of the voices like ours who are saying this are going to be suppressed as much as they possibly can because we're talking about billions of dollars and we're talking ultimately about hundreds of millions of people who stand to be thrown off their land. If you're new to these kinds of arguments this this can sound fairly crazy i mean we're all we've all been told conservation is fantastic it's you know everybody's nice old uncle it's david attenborough in the background uh, showing us the lions and all, all this stuff and it can seem very odd to, to suddenly have people popping up and saying actually it's terrible this thing that's going on is terrible and has been terrible for 100 years in Africa, 150 years in North America. So we're, trying, we're compressing a huge learning curve, as they call it, into 10 minutes. And, and I would just ask you not to immediately assume we're completely crazy uh, uh, and keep an open mind for a, for a little bit longer. Of course, how XR relates to all this is, is a big question, um, which is one of the things I hope we're going to talk about. But I, I would like Mordecai to to talk to us about how he sees it from a Kenyan perspective. Th th thank you. Thanks, Stephen. I think I think that's some good background. Now, um, from a from a Kenyan perspective, myself as a citizen of Kenya and also having worked in conservation in various part, other parts of Africa, we we must start, we must go back to the beginnings. It, it, that, it, that is my feeling, especially with the new move to have the 30%, the new proposed move to have 30% of land, landscapes or seascapes under conservation. It looks really good on the surface. And uh, as Stephen said, it's fronted by these um, people who are quote unquote above reproach, like David Attenborough, like Jane Goodall, uh, Greta Thunberg, um, which, 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 in my opinion, is 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 a very carefully calculated move to to bring in a child into into what is essentially what is essentially very hard nosed policy debates. And the fact is, 
we need to get back to the definition. What we are currently using as a definition for conservation areas is the IUCN definition, which loosely says that protected areas are areas set aside through legal and other means for the conservation of biodiversity. And there's some other details there. But the key point I want to make here is the and other means. Within those three words, that's where human rights violation lies. That's where disenfranchisement happens. That's where you have extrajudicial killings, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's where it all goes wrong. So protected areas, we first have to accept that they are monuments to injustice, not just in Africa, but all over the world. So if we want to expand them, we have to first look at what they are and understand fully what we are expanding. Because we cannot use one definition of anything to cover the entire world. Different countries even have different definitions for adults and children. And we have de different definitions for business, for education, for, for law, etc. So the idea that one definition, one size fits all when it, when it comes to protected areas is a fallacy. And what Stephen alluded to in terms of partnering with, uh, with uh, governments, UN and all that, this was brought forward shortly after the turn of the century, around 2004, 2005 as an idea for a new funding model to bring business into it, to make conservation a business. A commonly repeated line was that wildlife should, should and must pay its way. The, yet that's not how it works. The conservation of biodiversity is by definition cannot be a neoliberal sort of activity. But sadly now you have organizations, especially the big ones like the Nature Conservancy and Conservation International, actually putting forward the theory that this would be good for the economy. I'm not sure whose economy and which economy in which country, but on the ground, the people who are actual custodians of that nature are suffering because of this structured conservation. And there's no gray area about it. It's, the problem is the principle underlying it. If I may use the analogy, like if we talked about slavery in the Old South in the US, the problem was not the way people are treated on plantations, as horrendous as that was. The problem was slavery. So when we talk about details like involving communities, it's like talking about giving, making better slave quarters or, or, or using discussion instead of the whip. The problem is still slavery. The slavery is still there. Disenfranchisement is still there. There is no land on this earth that does not have its owners. So when we say protected area, we have to ask ourselves, protected from whom? Protected from what? And protected for whom? That's where we must start. Not, not, not at the, the, we have 11%, we want to get to 30%. That's, that's sort of like starting halfway up the tree as you're trying to climb. So I think we need to correct what conservation currently is before seeking to expand something that has so many inherent flaws in it. And I think that, that cannot be overemphasized because as an African now, when I hear people like uh, Edward Wilson saying that proposing the so-called half-earth theory for conservation of biodiversity, it worries me because I know that half of the earth that they want to conserve is not London or Germany or New York City. It's it's tropical Africa where I live, where I come from. It's tropical Asia, South America. These are the places by diversity. These are the places where the hammer is going to fall. It's not going to fall in Sweden where Greta Thunberg comes from. And, and this, these are the facts. And if you look at the forums where these things are being discussed, we have to address this straight that you do not see black people at those tables you do not see Asian people at those tables. You see white people. That cannot be overlooked in, in terms of decision making because the, the countries being affected most by these decisions are in the global south. So I think we have to start from the beginning. As we seek to conserve biodiversity, we can't start halfway. 
uh, saying we want to expand what we've been doing, yet what we have been doing has been so wrong for so many years. I'm aware, Claire, that you have to go soon. And I was wondering, yeah, what if, yeah, what if this is something you kind of heard about before, these issues with conservation, how you think, what role can XR play in this regard? Just whatever you feel. In terms of thinking about issues like land grab, I'm more conscious of those things in relationship to my kind of specialist area if you like which is um teaching on fashion and the environment um and so i'm aware of those kinds of practices how they play out but usually for the purpose i'm looking at of a cotton farm for example um or to look at the way that we're organizing using land globally to to meet these commodity requirements um and so i guess in that way it's very interesting to hear what you said, Mordecai, about like monetizing wildlife, making it pay for itself, um, because it speaks, I think, to the sort of domination um, mentality that that is sort of present in 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 the politics and the worldview that is really um, taking hold of um, of the entire sort of planet, the way that we organise ourselves in all in all of our societies, the sort of insidiousness of of the of the capitalist mindset and um and the, and the fact that this you know neo-colonial reality that we're sort of living in continues on uh with conservation included um i i think is probably something that we do well to to think about more deeply so i'm really really grateful for you guys holding this conversation and i guess in that regard there's also something for me here about the um the, the sort of the irony of um, global financial bodies, um, I can't remember if it was the IMF or the World Bank, but telling Bhutan to monetize their forest at the same time as we're having conversations about how to conserve biodiversity with urgency because we're in an extinction event. And so I think until we start to have these joined up conversations and, and, and get this kind of more widely thought about and more widely understood then we're doing that stupid thing where we're having a conversation about protecting something over here and monetizing and destroying something over here in relation to thinking about those people that you've mentioned david attenborough jane goodall and others i wouldn't include greta in this but i think the elder members of the kind of um wildlife protection and conservation world um have largely for me I've, I've seen them associated for a long time in a very unpoliticized way with institutions like the BBC and you know Jane Goodall recently was part of uh, British Airways 100 year anniversary advertising campaign and so everywhere we look there are people sort of saying one thing and appearing to sort of do another and I think that goes through individual behaviors and through the political way that all of this is playing out and so I think it's a really important kind of big concept to get people to understand and, and learn much more about and I also wonder kind of and perhaps this is something that Gail would come in on but you know in the UK obviously we've got a lot of people protesting against HS2 and that's a massive uh, destruction of, of biodiversity in, in this country and at the moment it feels that even when we're looking at the reality of something like that within the UK, there is little public understanding of what it means to obliterate life on that scale and commit crimes against nature and against wildlife. So yeah, there's much, much work to be done in uh, extending this conversation and, and, and pushing it further through, uh, through our networks and through the rebellion as well. And I love the title of the session, Merging merging rebellion because I've been since I'm in the media team at the moment in XI UK and I've been working to uh, build more relationships with Alejandra and others in the internationalist solidarity network the idea of us all merging the struggles around the world I think is it seems very clear to me that nobody wins this unless everybody wins it we, we've put ourselves in that position as a as a, as a planet I just need a clarification what's mm -hmm. HS HS2 is um, a high-speed train line. Oh, all which, right, okay. Which, okay. Uh, which is ploughing through many, many ancient forests and woodlands. And at the moment, there are quite a lot of our rebels 
in trees and on camps uh, defending those sites uh, and, and trying to prevent and, and delay the, the destruction of the woodlands. Thanks, Claire, for what you just said. It is actually remarkably similar. Um, what, what we are talking about versus what, what you mentioned on cotton farming, oil palm, and this kind of things. It's just a different kind of monoculture, if you will. It's, it's, it's a different kind of hegemony. So, so I, th I think th there's, there's remarkable similarity and it's just um, the, the, the world of conservation has invested millions of dollars and huge, huge uh, amounts of energy and time in messaging and PR and getting the looking good. So it's never a surprise when people are taken aback by anybody questioning what these conservation organizations are doing. So I think, I think there, is, there is quite a lot of thematic common ground where we can work together. And it comes to an issue, I think, of, of resource rights, human rights, and rights to self-determination, and rights to have your own aspirations in uh, Tanzania or Kenya or the UK without someone in another continent saying that the globe needs you to fall in line with this. I'm really deeply grateful for this um, information and conversation. It's super important we get educated and that we don't make mistakes. And I, I, I don't mean to sound like a name dropper, but it was because it doesn't happen very often. I was just in touch with Greta today and I've just alerted her and copied you in, Stephen, to this issue. I'm sh she's very strongly talking against racism and colonialism these days. And I'm sure she'd be appalled to be in any way associated with such a misinformation. Um, from this, for really early on from the start with um, XR in the UK, we started to think about internationally solidarity. Uh, we've, there's so many things that we've got wrong, messages that we've done wrong, that we didn't do strongly enough, things that don't always make it into the public domain that we do. And sometimes if you say things, it looks kind of a little bit virtue signaling and all the rest of it. Uh, international solidarity is super important to me personally. So we've always felt that uh, as, a, as an organisation, our time on the streets is likely to do some damage environmentally. It's clear, you know, our, our, some of the ways that we operate, some of the things that we get wrong. And a way to deal with that would not be to go and do some offset plants and trees somewhere, but would be to really actively think about international solidarity and from the perspective that we have to learn from each other, that we have to make these connections, that the, at the heart of the disease that's in Western culture is separation from each other, uh, from nature, from our own true uh, purpose and identity. And um, so it's, it's, it's super important to us. And I think it's really time to share the stories of what we've been doing with this network and to, and to build from it. I mean, it's interesting the points around the mistakes in conservation. We've just been reading a brilliant book by Isabella Trees um, that is focused on wilding of spaces in the UK. And you get really foolish attempts to protect a bird or a creature. And there's a really lack of understanding that things happen as a whole. And really, I guess the way I see it is that we start to see humanity in such a toxic way, in such a self-hating way, actually, as white people. We don't understand that that's what we're doing, but in a disconnected way that we don't understand that we can have a positive and beautiful interaction and relationship with nature. So I'm also reading um, another amazing book at the minute called Braiding Sweetgrass. She asks her, her class of ecologists, how many uh, things do you know about where humans are damaging nature? And of course they give loads of examples. She asked them, how many examples do you know of a positive interaction between humans and nature? And they can't come up with one. And these are ecology students. You know, so there's something uh, really uh, broken. And Extinction Rebellion is, is moving uh, through a project that I've been working on called Money Rebellion into now trying to speak more deeply about this malaise at the heart of humanity and I think that we have to win not just a kind of campaign battle here uh, to use that language I'm not particularly into war languages but a battle 
of ideas that humans are meant to be here, that we are meant to be in relationship uh, and that, you know, without exoticizing indigenous communities that we're being reminded that that's possible. My own spiritual practice um, is about reconnecting with my indigenous self. And uh, actually, if you read Amanda Scott's novels, uh, the Boudicca novels, um, she reminds us of the heritage that English people have where we get separated from the land and uh, the wounds that are there in us still. I'd like to to just underscore what, what Gail said, that um, my background is, a, is in ecology. Ecological studies are like a cult. Ignore the human dimensions. Uh, it's the ecosystem that's important. We are a problem, a necessary evil, if you will. Yet uh, science itself tells us, especially East Africa, where I come from, science tells us that uh, home humans uh, in various forms have been existing in Kenya for 1.6 million years. Yet, in 2020, science also tells us that humans are bad for the environment in Kenya. So, so I think this fragmentation of knowledge into, into anthropology that shouldn't cross into ecology, that shouldn't cross into sociology, that shouldn't cross into, into physics, etc. That is, that is where I think um, us as humanity, we are, we are really failing where our ancestors succeeded. Having done my degree in conservation for three years, they really hammer home this, that you end up feeling like humans are the worst thing that happened to the earth. And it's like, why do we even exist in the first place? And yeah, but I'll just stop there. <laughs> um, wondered if maybe, yeah, Stephen or Fiore, you would like to add anything else? Uh, sometimes we... we... Uh, we, we discuss about it and we talk about it and, and we think that um, that people have good intentions like uh, what that was at the beginning I thought when I start working I'm a field researcher so I go on the field and I start thinking uh, well maybe um, they have good intentions they really like to uh, they, they really like to preserve the nature and, 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 and whatever the idea of nature is uh, and then they, they just um, find, as, as they say, in Africa or in Asia, uh, very difficult structures um, to work with. And that's the reason why then we, we, we find human rights abuses. Well, um, I, I think that that is a very dangerous uh, way to phrase things. And I think it's very important to understand that is the whole idea at the base of this system, the idea of nature they have, that is completely wrong and is fascist. They think that nature is pure, and, and that, that human beings, as we were saying, are destroying it. Are, um, and, they, and then we uh, need to explain to them. I was, uh, someone were mentioning uh, uh, before in a question about Jane Goodall, and, and she was doing an interview uh, two days ago saying, uh, we have to explain to people how to treat nature. They don't understand. You know, Africans are bad, they are, they are, they are cutting the trees. And, and no one explained that those trees are coming actually to our house to build a IKEA mobile furniture. Um, and, and there is this misunderstanding. And it's the same thing with, we, we have been pointing out in the climate change movement. People are still talking about we have to green our economy. There is no green capitalism. And, and, and they are just cheating us. There is, it, there is no uh, sustainable development. Development as it is now, it can be sustainable. And we are asking those people, the indigenous people, the last people that are contributing to pay the price. And we are not only destroying their way of life, we are transforming them in what exactly is harming the environment. Because when they don't have anything to eat, and I have seen this a lot of times in Africa, we are not talking about they, they go there and they build a park and that's it. Those people are hunter gatherers, are, are, are they using the forest? That means when you create a national park and you forbid them to go in, you are condemning these people to starve. There is no other way. They're just not, not like compromise. They, they, you can't learn how to become, I don't know. You can't start, be, I don't know, putting, um, could be in an agriculture or, or building houses. You are a hunter gatherer. That's what you do. And, and they, they forbid them to, um, to eat meat, to hunt meat. Um, and, and these people are starving. But those, those practices were actually not harming the environment. It's the opposite. They are part of the ecosystem. It's thanks to these kind of practices that the ecosystem is what it is today. 
It's not, uh, as we always say in survival, a completely coincidence that the 80% of biodiversity is in indigenous people's land. It's like, it's not a coincidence. They have been uh, shaping this environment for generations. And, and, and with the COVID-19, and I, that's something I wanted to say, there is like a push for this, um, um, pushing, they are pushing this idea that the loss of biodiversity and the wildlife consumption is linked to the virus. And, and the idea that the, 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 the big conservation organizations, but also government are pushing is that we have to create more protected areas and we have to ban wildlife consumption. And they're not talking about banning farm animal consumptions, which also cause a lot of epidemics. And so behind this ideology, there is not just they are trying to do the good thing. They just want to make a half, a part of the humanity to starve. And because, and this is the same thing with overpopulation, they don't want that we focus on the real causes of the environmental destruction, which is our overconsumption. And they're asking these people to pay the price. And it's, it's, it's not just a good story what we are telling. Uh, I can see it with my eyes. They, they are beating and um, arresting these people that are uh, hunting to feed their families. At the end, the indigenous people end up in prison where they are raped and they're abused. And, and it's such a, a big and a huge thing. It's not just a collateral damage. Uh, it, we are really destroying the life of these people. So I just, I, I feel that sometimes we have to remi remi remind ourselves what we are talking about. It's an entire system. It's the structure of the system that is wrong. Uh, and it's aimed to destroy the life of these people. This is a, a conscious and deliberate uh, attempt to uh, change people's ways of life. This is not accidental. Wildlife Conservation Society, which is a really big American conservation organization, has come out openly and said, uh, uh, everybody is now saying we've got to end the wildlife trade. They don't appear to be talking about venison in expensive restaurants uh, or, or fish for that matter. They, but WCS has said uh, people in Africa can eat chicken or farmed fish. And they published this. Now, uh, if you look at Africa, there are obviously lots of different ways to live. Broadly, you can, you can separate them into people who live largely by their agricultural produce, people who live largely by herding, pastoralism, and uh, people who live uh, largely by hunting and gathering. And there's lots of crossover and overlap and all the rest of it. That's not what the conservationists want. They want people to uh, uh, have basically no self-sufficiency on the land. They want to push them into a situation of dependence on industrialized food production. Um, and uh, th this, this is conscious. It's, it, it's very similar to how European governments have viewed things like Roma peoples, all, all nomadic people, all mobile peoples. Governments don't like them. They want to get rid of them. And it's not accidental that when the, the British uh, uh, were forced out of Kenya, semi-forced out of Kenya in, in the 60s, they made very certain that the prevailing uh, government was going to be composed largely of people who live by agriculture, which is how, how the the British see it. So pastoralism in Africa is, is widely decried by environmentalists and has been for, for generations. And in fact, it provides a, self, a sustainable livelihood for literally millions, tens of millions of people. This is a quite conscious uh, uh, move to force people into a certain way of life to reduce human diversity based basically on white supremacist thinking. That, that's that's the, the long and the short of it. And that message is very severely repressed by the mainstream media, by the conservation organizations, obviously, and so on and so forth. So it's it's very difficult to have an open debate about this when these things we're saying, which, uh, you know, millions of uh, people, uh, pastoralists in Africa uh, know, and it's so alien in Europe that when you express them, people look at you as if you're completely crazy. That makes it very difficult to have a 
to have a debate about this. Um, and un unless we really pushing and get some kind of momentum behind the, the, the voices which are articulating this point of view, I, I, the, for instance, when we attack these big conservation organizations nowadays, they don't respond at all. And that is clearly what they're advised to do by the barrister uh, advisors. It's best not to get into a debate. They don't respond at all. I also myself think they don't respond at all because they, they know that they don't need to. They've got the BBC pushing out the image of conservation in Africa. They've got Goodall. They've got all the, all the white conservationists. They've got millions of dollars, billions of dollars behind them. They don't need to bother to answer these criticisms. So the only reason they'll get into a debate about it is to try and basically tie up the, the, the voices, the criticism, uh, and engage it in a protracted, endless debate, which will go nowhere. So the consciousness, the deliberation behind this is is um, deeply shocking. Can I say something? Just for everyone watching, Kofi's one of the joint coordinators for XRISN. I think it's Chidi who asked the question, how do you harmonize global and local concerns? It is a simple way of localization, but localization in terms of harmonizing the local community's uh, needs with those of Mother Earth and who are best placed to actually uh, do that other than indigenous communities that have remained faithful to the land and closer to nature than any other communities that have been divorced very much from, from the land and nature. So some of these things, they are very, very simple. And when for our colleagues in Africa talk about the ecological harmonization of the built and the natural environment, that is the way to go. But as has been uh, clearly pointed out, Mordecai and, and others, the problem is the system that, is, that continues to be globalized. This system of, neo, of, of neoliberal capitalism, you know, that seeks to commodify everything in order for a few to make profit. And they co-opt even the best of our courses, you know, like environmental justice to say, okay, on that basis, you know, indigenous communities on land are the problem, move them out of the way so that they have the opportunity to profit from their own uh, the, uh, imagination of what the, the purity of nature, you know, is. And that, that is the problem, it's not gonna stop. Now for me, what, one of the difficulties I really have with responses from Europe and, and the global north to these issues is to try try and frame them in the way of charity or enjoyization, right? And, and that for me is very, very difficult because even within XR, when some people talk about, um, oh, let's take actions in support of indigenous communities, it is still framed like a charitable act. Why? Because the one thing that is not at the center of the responses is what Modeka has talked about, the right to self-determination of these indigenous communities, the necessity for them to, to hold on to their land, reclaim what has been stolen from them, you know, and be the ones who determine what relationships people have to their, to their environment, right? You can march and do all the protest actions you want. You can throw money at these communities in terms of COVID and other things, so long as we are not going back to supporting the right to self-determination of these indigenous communities, and that becomes a central feature of what we do, you know, all of this is just actually wasting everybody's time and being grossly hypocritical. In fact, one of the things that uh, Stephen has said very much, in certain areas, you can't try this kind of uh, conservation right because the people are well organized and will defend their right to to not just their land but to their way of life and it talks about nepal for example why is it that when we talk about indigenous communities 
It is all about charity, charity, charity. You know, they have this problem, let's help them to fix it. But we, we shy away from the, the, the politics of their right to self-determination and support their rebellion to accept their right to self-determination. And I think that is the challenge to Extinction Rebellion and to, to the uh, uh, environmental movement in the global north in its current phase. You know, if it, is, if it shies away from the, the struggles of indigenous communities, particularly in the global south, to reclaim their lands and to reassert their sovereignty, and therefore be part of those struggles and support those particular struggles and the formations they have, not this kind of indigenous ideas about indigenous communities where there's no politics there. They don't have their own organizations. They're just some group to pity and try to aid with relief measures. But it is to support fundamentally their rebellion. And this is actually the call upon Extinction Rebellion, whether it wants to merge its rebellion with the long running rebellion of these indigenous communities to, to hold on to their land and to their way of life, or it simply wants to throw charity at them and get them to do the kind of things that a lot of people who say they are envir environmentalists or ecologists in the global north are trying to push onto them. That is the challenge for Extinction Rebellion. And we in SRSN are very clear. It is a, their struggle, their rebellion for self-determination, that is what we are supporting. And it's the movements they have for that purpose. These are the movements we have to support. We're not supporting merely charitable gimmicks as far as these indigenous communities are concerned. Yeah, wanted to hear a bit more about this project that you've been working on. And I think it's like very closely linked to Extinction Rebellion it is going to be part of Extinction Rebellion as far as I know and it's probably about to come but just to thank uh, Kofi uh, for the you know information he's just uh, shared and uh, the perspective that needs to be embedded in all we do. You know, I'm a, a, a white English woman raised in a country that has had such a depth of history um, and colonization. It's in our brains and our minds and um, we have to educate ourselves of course and um, I am always grateful for every reminder that we get to decolonize our brains and to um, move into a different understanding of how the how the world needs to you know and how the environmental movement needs to understand the changes that are needed um, anyway uh, money rebellion is definitely part of that and um, trying to embody that kind of uh, message of solidarity and of change and of, of uh, relationship, I would say. I mean, um, rights is, is part of the message, but it's like the relationship that we have with each other. It's the connection that we have with each other. It's the sort of understanding of, of one human family and one uh, family within nature. Mm -hmm. So Money Rebellion is to look at um, a couple of things, really. One is the uh, idea of Wetiko. Uh, which is a, a term from the Algonquin languages of uh, native peoples in North America. Mm -hmm. And it's one way of talking about patriarchy, which is the underlying um, system and mindset that um, spurred colonialism and, and other abuses that happen in the world. I mean, people have different words that they prefer to use and so on. Um, so it's, the, it's embedded in the logic of the economic system that we have uh, this idea, for example, as people have said, that you could have green growth when GDP tracks uh, completely with uh, material consumption and the two just can't carry on in the way that they are. Um, so Money Rebellion is about taking financial, economic, civil disobedience uh, to talk about the economic system. So it might be non-payment of debts, non-payment of mortgages, non-payment of taxes and so on. And the way we will build towards it is finding out what appetite people have, how many people need to join you and so on. We have some um, early actions that we're in discussion with organisations about. So, for, so one thing that we're talking about doing, and it's really important that we get the message in right, just in the way that um, Kofi was naming there, is the idea of making donations on behalf of banks that are creating harm in the world. Now, you know, 
we might have to pick a different word donation sound charitable and there's nothing about it that you know that's not the intention uh it's it's about stopping the harm and repairing the harm and uh acknowledging and honoring the rights of of people whose whose lands are being decimated um a, a way to do that would be to work with organizations that are supporting uh, organizations to fight legal battles and so on when you have to fight on those kinds of, of, of grounds so I mean that's where some of the costs are nobody wants to um, reinforce dependency or the idea that what this is all about is about uh, money it's it's not but it is about the economic system that we are uh, perpetuating and, and participating in and I think it's a, a really crucial move for XR to both talk about the um, underlying the way I say it is wounds you know the underlying issues that we all carry through having been raised in a culture that is so separating and, and reinforces powerlessness and the idea of scarcity um, with, with this belief that we, we we can only participate in this form of economic system uh, it's killing life on earth it's it's um, the way one person said it is is that uh, we're all on the same ship some of us are on the upper decks and so on but it's it's sinking um so yeah i just wanted to talk about that uh, uh process that's coming forward soon the sort of money rebellion what gail has, has alluded to is is very very important because the source uh, the sources of um the, the the funding models being put together now are feeding off those flawed financial systems and just plugging the quote unquote conservation industry into it. And the global South Africa, Kenya being one of them, ends up being our whole conservation sector becomes like a, a client of sorts, where policy ideas, tourism, what's important, what's not, are all ideas that are external because of the money system. Once, once something is monetized, the guy who has more money instantly becomes in charge. And, and that, that, that is, it's, it's very important that we, we short circuit that, that system in some way. So I find that very exciting because I've, I've never actually thought of, uh, thought of doing it from that end because the, the end I've been doing it from is, is more the philosophical and uh, sociological end, but the financial end is, is very very important because it it drives all sorts of problems in conservation like now we have defense con contractors um, mercenaries uh, people from the special forces on all all different kinds of countries getting into conservation and these are not law enforcers these are tactically trained killers and they're all getting into conservation and it's simply because there's so much money there and 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 it flows it flows so heavily to certain places so i think this this is a very important approach also to take that the money rebellion is is crucial i suppose there are all kinds of potential next steps and we're trying to unravel this deep-seated 150 year old lie and uh, it's the same lie as white supremacy basically um as colonialism as indeed the uh the development model everybody has to live uh feeding the the one system and there are some some people at the top as it were who uh, everybody else has to work and that all their resources are have to flow upwards the, these are all very closely associated lies but a lot of people believe them <laughs> particularly in conservation most people buy into the idea that you know the population is there's an overpopulation pro problem uh, or, or all these africans are going to overrun our um environment um it's it's difficult to to address the level of um radical action that is needed until we know whether there's a kind of appetite whether people understand what we're talking about i i, I suppose um people now understand the concept of climate change i think pretty successful apart from the crazies trump like people and then that is now 
done. The understanding is there. But we're but the understanding of the issue we're talking about isn't there as yet. It's still a shock to to many people here today. Um who you know want corroboration they want to know if, is this real well what are the examples and the fact that there are examples going back 150 years and if you look you can find countless examples um millions of people conservation refugees is one term named for them there's already been millions of people dispossessed by this process and yet people including people like you alejandro who did your Degreed, uh, uh, this is all kept from you basically, and it's because the teachers don't know it. So, where do we need to go to 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 get the idea across? The tourists turning up in Kenya are, are going to see elephants uh, and lions, and the Africans are there to drive the the vehicles, wait on table, do the cooking and washing up. Uh, and and that that's it, uh, but that's what's in their head. That's what the Torah. That's how they've always seen it. So actually, unraveling that, and um, particularly when there's such massive vested interests in keeping the system going, is is not at all obvious to to me or us at survival. I mean, we write articles, we talk to people, we do all those kinds of things. Um, but we don't get into the the mainstream media, and we're not going to get into the mainstream media. And there, there are even people who are perceived as progressives. I won't name any names, but there's some obvious people in Britain who are perceived as progressive on the conservation issue that still won't touch this. So, so you know, what what do we need to do next, as it were? different movements will play like different roles and i guess it's about this whole like movement of movements that we talk about like no single movement will be the key for like the solution and solve it in its own like that but you need like movements for example organizations like survival who do a lot of the like support and all this knowledge and bringing and then you've got movements like extinction rebellion who are based on direct action and I guess like kind of a bit of the frame of this webinar is kind of like, I guess asking yourselves a uh, survival international, what could XR, like a climate ecological kind of collapse direct action group do to tackle the like, what, what is the role they can play in this sense? Like there are a bunch of people willing to lock themselves onto stuff or glue themselves onto things more than, but yeah, what is the role that a group like that can play within this like fight? Stephen has pointed out very correctly that it's an issue of education to get people to grasp that this whole conservation approach is just a big lie. And in fact, when you examine it very closely, it is still the agenda of trying to return to direct colonization, which is to deprive people who are seen, who are deemed to be undeserving of land and power. And we need to find very various ways and means of channeling this uh, uh, in terms of educational programs into existing movements. And that is why I think the merge rebellion thing is important. And let's start with recognizing the rebellion of these indigenous communities and their right to self-determination and not think that that is completely outside of, for example, the, the resolving the climate and ecological crisis. Because without self-determination and uh, the accession of their sovereignty over their lands. I mean, how can they have the power to ensure that their environment is not being polluted, right? They are completely at the mercy of foreign forces. We need to find ways and means of uh, getting this into various movements that can take the issue up from their specific angles. And that is why the reparations movement is extremely important because 
you know, if these, these communities have for hundreds of years been subjected to this, to really this ecocide, mm -hmm. the denial of their rights to determination, and they need to reclaim that right. It's a reparatory justice right of this to contribute to planet repairs, as we say in XRISN, by asserting their right to self-determination, right? And not to be bullied by all these agendas that are coming from outside, as if they have no knowledge about conservation themselves, right? So, so, so when it comes to, for example, activities like the 1st of August, African Emancipation Day, let's see how we can participate to educate the other participants in such activities on issues of this nature. And, and that is how I think that by developing various ways of popular education, we should include bringing in the voices, the direct voices of these indigenous communities to represent themselves and emphasizing also their right to political voice, right? So that it's not NGOs that are NGOizing how they, 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 they speak about their own situation. They have a right to express themselves you know, on everything, including their own politics, including their own knowledge systems, you know. And if we insist on doing things with them like that, then I think the public that begins to hear, particularly the global norm that begins to hear, it makes a huge impression in terms of speaking from Kenya, from the ground, as an African to the world on these issues with real knowledge and experience. And I think that the more the public in the global north are introduced to people from these communities to hear their own voices, their own perspectives, their own experiences. I think that the people in the global north will also become better educated on this issue. So let, for me, it's, it's how we bring various movements to approach this educational work on this issue from a wide diversity you know, of uh, uh, angles. And the role of survival international in this, you know, is, is, is vital. A lot of people kind of seem to be asking how to be in solid, how can they be in solidarity with some of the like struggles of indigenous communities? And how do you think, do you believe is the best way for people may, mainly based here in the global north to sort of support this or be in solidarity? What would you say? As Stephen was saying, uh, that no one knows about this issue. I, I think that it's important, especially for people involved in, involved in climate change movements, they start talking about it. I think that the first thing is to start to inform about who these people are, what, which are the interested, where these uh, trees are going to be planted, where, where these conservation areas are going to be created. We have the responsibility because now the European Commission is rewriting the agenda about climate change uh, and biodiversity strategy, and uh, for, for everyone is something positive. And the only thing they are focused, as we were saying before, is in the missions. And I think that is important that as climate um, activists, because that is what ex mostly of Extinction Rebellion's activists are involved, they start raising the question, who is going to pay the price for all of this? And it, is it about, is it fair to put the focus on these issues? So there are other issues. Raising the indigenous people problem is, is something that it requires a lot of education, so we have to inform ourselves. Um, but we, we, there are other ways, uh, especially now that there are social, social networks that we can, we can push this message. We can talk out, speak out. It's very important because no one knows about it. Uh, so I think that sharing, um, well, uh, tweets or, or articles or, or joining uh, or following certain people in Facebook can make a difference, uh, especially well today where uh, everything is, is, is done in, in those platforms. Um, that we don't have to do uh, actually a lot. Look how much the climate change movement uh, grow, uh, gr in, in, is growing just because of the internet. Uh, so uh, th there is a possibility to start talking about these issues and to raise these issues. Uh, I think that it's not done because people is mostly focusing on the wrong <laughs> On the wrong answer, we have to understand that indigenous people are are we are talking about about communities that don't have uh, m money or don't have or don't have will to buy a smartphone and use Twitter and and they, their voices are not heard. Uh, they they don't they don't do TED conference uh, and they are not influencers. 
And, and, and that's why the, the work of survival is so important because we go to, to talk with these communities and we don't represent those communities. This is very important. We don't represent tribal people. We just go there and ask them, do anything you want to say. And then we come uh, to Europe or to the United States and we share those messages. So um, first of all, I think we have to uh, be, uh, as Stephen said in one of his articles, iconoclast. We have to, first of all, try to decolonize our mind to understand what is the problem and try to not repeat the same abuses in the movements we are creating, in the dialogues we are having. And I think that's the first thing we should do. It, it's not just, you know, what happens over there, uh, as it were, which is the problem. The, the, this movement of 30 percent of uh, fiscalization of nature is after the huge amounts of money which are now floating around for climate change they want to divert the money which which governments want to put into climate change and they basically want to take it themselves that that's what we're talking about so if uh, unless this kind of thing is understood and people start talking about it it's it really is not just going to damage um people in africa it's going to damage the whole thing uh to and we're talking about billions of dollars and that's how they see it they they see nature as an an investment make money from it you can make money from it and if you if you follow the not very much information that's out there around this that's the recurrent message now how to make profit from nature and and what they're actually making money from is largely taxpayers money uh government money un money and, and they want it because until fairly recently it's uh, certainly some of the big conservation organizations were distinctly feeling the fi financial pressure um and this is a way they can they can open up millions of dollars for them I mean, most of conservation is going to, to for, for them, it's going to e experts to go in and do studies and plans. The, the national park, the proposed national park in Congo, which FIO has spent years looking at and going and talking to the people, it's been on the table for 10 years. It's already cost several million. It doesn't exist yet. What's all those millions gone in? It's gone in paying for reports, for experts, for flights, for hotels. Uh, and none of it has gone into anything to do with protecting nature or anything like that. It's just internalized. Just quickly, I'll, I'll say that the people who, who wonder how to do this are, are baffled by the, the choices that are put before them. And what they need to understand is that nature is not something out there that you need to go and take ownership of or or take care of because it belongs to someone and this this follows on to colonialism in africa nature in africa belonged to the local people there before colonialism colonialism came and suddenly it belonged to the crown or it belonged to Germany or belonged to Belgium or whoever. Then after independence, now it suddenly belongs to the world. No, we need it to belong to its owners. So nature conservation has to adhere to other structures. My children are mine. So why are my elephants belonging to, or why are my chimps Jane Goodalls? If my children are mine and my house is mine, that people just need to, bring that thinking into into conservation as well that's why we have things like transboundary parks we have conservation organizations running roughshod across international boundaries and imposing their will on across boundaries etc because of this global quote unquote global approach so i think we need to be very careful when we talk about global concerns when someone tells you you need to be concerned about what's going on with the hyenas in kenya you need to ask more questions. Why isn't he telling me to be concerned about the school children in Kenya or something else in Kenya? So we need to ask ourselves and why we need why why are we concerned and what is our what is our position? So the, the question of ownership and aspirations must come into conservation. That's why we cannot have something miles away suddenly 
owned, quote unquote, by someone else somewhere. And that, that's where the problem lies. And that's why injustice seems kosher when it's done in the conservation arena. So people just have to ask, ask questions. Go and participate in whatever is already going on there, but do not give money to someone who wants to impose something. Do not go there to try and impose something. Go there to learn. Go there to participate in what's already happening. But do not go there with some work plan to implement some idea you've come up with in, in, in your mm -hmm. place, wherever that may be. And I think that that's that's important. And and um, and if if you have money to do this, use the money to travel and go see that that place. Don't give it to somebody in your country saying that he's going to do something far away. Thank you, uh, Mordica. I think that that's a good note to end this conversation with. Um, I just wanted to really thank all the speakers uh, for coming up here today i know it's it's really difficult to condense such a vast <laughs> topic essentially in you know a brief conversation but as i'd like to say it's just like hopefully this is opening the door to many more conversations for whoever's watching <coughs> this for them to ask themselves questions that they haven't asked before and i think that's where we can start and get the ball rolling basically but yeah just wanted to end with that and yeah really appreciate your time in here and yeah thanks, thanks for inviting us no but yeah it's always a pleasure i really enjoy uh, listening to this and seriously every time even like thinking loads so thank you <laughs>